This episode has been brought to you by our super generous supporters on Patreon. This is Moore's Law. The number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles every two years, approximately. This has been true for 50 years now. Nearly all computer advancement in that time can be attributed to Moore's Law. But Moore's Law isn't actually a law at all. It's merely an observation. Yet it has driven computer speed and power for decades now, like a fixed law of nature. But now it seems to be breaking down. Good Stuff producer Matt Weber tells the story of how Moore's Law ruled computers, but its decades long reign might be coming to an end. Back in 1965, computers still took up entire rooms and cost as much as a house. But Gordon E. Moore was able to look at all the progress they had made in that time and project it into the future. He observed that microchip complexity, the amount of transistors packed into an integrated circuit, had doubled every year since 1959, and he saw no reason to think that this growth wouldn't continue unabated for the next decade or so. This is Moore's law, and that simple observation would dictate computer performance and design for decades to come. In 1975, 10 years after Moore's law debuted, Moore revised it to say that transistor density would double every two years instead of one. Then David House, an executive at Intel, adopted it and revised it to mean computer performance instead of transistor density. And in House's version of Moore's law, computer performance would double every 18 months. And this is really what we think of when we think of Moore's law, faster, better, smaller computers. But Moore's law isn't so much a law like Newton's laws as it is a guideline. It's a benchmark every computer manufacturer and manufacturer of computer components could aim for. Each year they could look to Moore's law and everyone in Silicon Valley knew where they needed to be. And this is extended to the entire world. Moore's law facilitated an unprecedented amount of cooperation across an industry populated by thousands of different companies, building a wide variety of products, often in competition with each other. So in the course of those five decades, it's hard to say whether Moore's prediction was spot on, or if the computer industry merely conformed to Moore's projection. So in that sense, the electronics industry sort of turned Moore's law into a self-fulfilling prophecy. But just because the industry drove Moore's law, just as Moore's law drove the industry, didn't mean it could go on indefinitely. Moore's law is exponential, but the technology itself has limitations, and we've run up against some of those limitations in recent years. Although we've come to expect increased performance with increased transistor density, Moore's law never meant for the two terms to be interchangeable. In recent years, the computer industry has witnessed a decoupling between these two benchmarks, with increased transistor density leading to only minimal performance increases. Evidence of the slowing progress of Moore's law can be found at the company Moore himself founded. Intel. Intel has delayed future transistor improvements and increased the time between upgrades. The company has even suggested that silicon-based chips will stop shrinking altogether within five years. We've come to expect computers to get smaller and lighter every year, and this is a direct result of making microchips ever more densely packed with transistors, which is what Moore's law decrees. But there's a limit on how small we can go. One impediment is heat. To make your computer faster, you have to make the electrons in the circuits run faster. But the faster you move your electrons around the circuit, the more heat you generate. And heat is hard to get rid of. But if you don't want to get third degree burns from your smartphone, you have to put a speed limit on your processor. Companies have been doing just this for over a decade. In fact, the maximum clock speed in a computer plateaued in 2004 and has remained unchanged ever since. To make up for the loss in processor speed, companies have found a workaround. They increase the number of processors. Dual core, quad core, even eight cores are common in today's computers, and it's a direct result of having to put the brakes on processor speed. Multiple separate processor cores act pretty much like a single super fast core, except any problem the computer needs to compute has to be divvied up amongst all the processors. And this means that if there are eight cores, there has to be eight algorithms working in parallel on a single problem. This can be tricky, to say the least, and even impossible at times. There's also a limit on how close the electrons can be spaced too close and the efficiency of the chip degrades. Thus, there's a limit to how dense the transistors can be on the circuit. And if the transistors are built too small, they begin exhibiting quantum behavior. Then the electrons become unpredictable and the chips themselves become unreliable. Then there's the ultimate limit. You can't build transistors smaller than an atom because they are themselves made up of atoms. They can't be smaller than their constituent building blocks. We haven't run into this limit quite yet, but it's coming in the next decade or so, and we might just run out of money before that happens. Moore's second law states that the cost to manufacture exponentially more complex microchips increases exponentially. So someday it will be prohibitively expensive to build smaller, denser microchips. But this is more than a technological problem. Economic growth is tied to productivity, 
and over the last few decades, productivity has been fueled by computer power. Companies and research labs who depend on faster, better, smaller computers for their advancement could be hindered by limited processor speeds. And if this year's newest model is only marginally better than last year's, consumers will be more likely to stick with their old computers and skip purchasing the new model. As Moore's law breaks down, so does the engine that has been driving much of our economy. All of today's microchips are made out of silicon, which has worked fine for the last 50 years or so. But if we're gonna overcome the limitations of Moore's law, we're gonna have to abandon silicon for another alternative material. Some researchers are exploring exotic forms of carbon, like graphene, which are only one atom thick, or they're attempting to harness electron spin to process information more efficiently, or there's the promise of quantum computing, which could utilize the weird behavior at the smallest realms of the universe to make processors that can handle multiple computations at the same time. But whether it's whole new materials or whole new physics, the fact is most of these proposals have barely made it out of the lab, and there's no way of knowing which one will be the winner. For the first time in 50 years, the future of computers is uncertain, and there's no Gordon Moore-like prophet to show us the way. But until we find that new material or technology, we are stuck with silicon. To make up for a lack in processor progress, computer and electronics manufacturers have to become more clever. More apps, flashier designs, and new add-ons all take the place of more tangible improvements. While these extras can enhance the user experience or make a device easier or more enjoyable to use, they don't necessarily improve the computer's performance by much. The entire computer industry has been based on the premise that every new model is a leap forward in technology, and that premise has been based on Moore's Law. With the end of Moore's Law in sight, this premise becomes more and more a technological sleight of hand, with no actual improvement happening. Before Silicon Valley filled up with scientists and startups, the main industry was agriculture. The valley was home to farmers and fruit trees. These orchards eventually gave way to microchip plants, and silicon became the bumper crop. Now silicon is on the way out. What its successor might be cannot be known for sure. For 50 years, we've had Moore's Law to guide us and to keep us on track. It allowed thousands of disparate companies, all competing with one another for market share, to cooperate and progress in unison, to work as a single unit for a common goal. And this unprecedented unity and purpose gave us one of the greatest technological booms in human history. Because Moore's Law is ultimately about optimism. It was about looking toward the future, and not just hoping things could get better, but knowing they had to get better. And the only aspect of Moore's Law that can't be broken, that can't be revised, is its fearless pursuit of progress. So, what do you think? Can we replace Moore's Law, or will a new method or material save Moore's Law and keep it going into the foreseeable future? Or, are we just gonna go back to being cavemen? Let us know in the comments. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters for making this episode possible. We're completely supported by Patreon, so if you'd like to keep this show improving at an exponential rate, head on over to Patreon and support the show. Thanks for watching.